what's going on? Welcome to another edition of Gen Sports Corner back at you for July 24th, 2023. And look, I ain't going to do a whole lot of talking, but you know the drill. Like, subscribe, click the notification bell so you know every time I drop it, you know. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this fight coming up tonight, 4.30 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. It's taking place over in Japan, the monster, Naoya Inoue versus cool boy Steph. Stephen Fulton, man. Yo, man. Philly boy going over to going over to Japan, man. Hey, I hope he enjoys the vacation. But more importantly, I hope that he has a great fight. Uh, same thing for anyway. I'm actually a fan of both guys. And there's been a lot of controversy going into this fight. We have the big fight coming up this week between Earl Spence Jr. and Terrence Crawford, obviously. But this is the other big fight that I've been clamoring for. And let's just go right into it. Uh, break down what each fighter brings to the table, what their attributes are, strengths, weaknesses, and who's going to win this fight. But before we get into that, we have to talk about one thing and one big thing, and that is the accusations, or those are the accusations that were made by Stephen Fulton's team, or more importantly, his trainer, not even Stephen Fulton him, himself, at the press conference leading into this fight a couple of days ago. And that was big, big news all over the headlines. And it was that his trainer was accusing anyway of having loaded wraps, stacking his hand wraps. Now I'm not saying Stephen Fulton wasn't thinking the same thing, but he said that he didn't want to bring it up during the pre-fight, you know, festivities or whatnot, but his trainer brought it up because he was concerned about it. All right. And he claimed that in a way was his his team was double stacking the wraps and making them really thick to the point that they were cast like. And that, look, is valid concern if that's going on? I don't know. And he said, look, we have proof. I have it on my phone of previous fights where they were putting tape, gauze, tape, gauze in amounts that were abnormal. I'll put it like that. Now, I don't know if he meant gauze tape, then gauze and tape, because that's that's typically how you do it. You put the gauze on, then you tape that over to lock it in. Then you might put more gauze over that for more padding and then tape that in. And then you would go ahead and uh, the commission or I don't know, a member of the other team would be witnessing it. And then the commissioner would sign off on the hand wraps to say, OK, these are legal go ahead and put the gloves on and let's go ahead and get to the fight. That's typically how it goes. All right. Now, a couple of points of contention from my standpoint, and let me know what you people think my boxing heads in here. People that are football, baseball, basketball, you can go ahead and just let this go in one ear and out the freaking other. But for my boxing heads, let me know what you guys think about this. One, if this was truly an issue, wouldn't you bring this up? weeks or months in advance prior to the fight why would you bring this up not only days before the fight but also like once you're over in japan okay like you're there's money that's on the line you know people book flights bought tickets why would you wait to the last minute to bring this up and then threaten to pull out of the fight and i'm talking i'm re referencing fulton's trainer not fulton himself OK, because Fulton looked surprised himself when his trainer brought that up during the um, press conference questions, uh, question and answer session. So that's one. OK, why would you bring it up this late into the um, preparation for the fight when well, you're damn near at fight night? Second, this the way he has he's had his hand wrap hands wrapped when he's been fighting in Japan, because he's fought in Japan a lot, all right? The way he's been having his hands wrapped is not illegal under the standards and bylaws um, over there in Japan, okay? And then secondly, the way he has his hands wrapped, that's allowed in certain parts of the U.S. I don't know about Nevada, per se, but in certain parts of the U.S., that's allowed. Every state has different regulations based on its individual athletic commission. Okay, Nevada State Athletic Commission does not necessarily have the same rules as the New York State Athletic Commission 
or an athletic commission that you would find over in London or the UK as a whole or over in Japan, right? Every place is different, but he's fought over in the US. He's fought in Nevada at least once or twice, and he's fought in, this is not his first rodeo over here. And guess what? He's still got knockouts in those fights. So then what is the explanation for why he's still sending people to the shadow realm, even though he's not able to wrap his hands in the same way when he's fighting over in the US? All right, so that's that's part number two. And then part number three, nobody's stopping you from wrapping your hands the same way. I know you don't want to, which is fine, but unless you have something, unless you have, now, usually when you wrap the hands, you have the gauze and the, the gauze and then the tape over it. And it has to be, I think, about an inch below the knuckles. That's where the the wrapping has to stop. As long as it's an inch below the knuckles, everything's good. And you have a certain amount of, I guess, gauze that's acceptable. Okay. And then on top of that, like I mentioned before with the first point, a member of the opposing camp typically is there to witness the hands being wrapped from beginning to end, from nothing on the hands to the point where it gets signed off on. So any discrepancies you'd be able to see anyways. So I, I don't really understand where the big hoopla is. Because if you're if your guys are there witnessing the hands being wrapped, nothing should get by you. We saw this play out famously in the fight between um Antonio Margarito and Sugar Shane Mosley about what 15 years ago now? It's been it's been a while, but the late great Nassim Richardson pointed it out, said, Whoa, that looks sketchy. No, you need to rewrap that. I don't like what you have there. Allegedly, they they found um a piece of hardened material more more um commonly known or referred to as pastor plaster of paris and that's the material that when um when you sweat or you have any type of moisture come into contact with it it hardens up almost in the the, the form of like a cement like um compound and obviously that's going to be dangerous because you can't one is is going you're going to feel it when you get hit and two you can't really pick up on it if you haven't seen the hands being wrapped because you're, all right, you're like okay his hands got wrapped boom you start moving around you're punching and you start sweating and guess what sweat builds up on your hands in the gloves and that sweat will interact with the plaster of Paris and ca cause it to form like a concrete brick like structure compound in your gloves and you can end up killing somebody. And, and nobody would be any the wiser, right? And this is something that's been speculated to have happened to Miguel Cotto in his first fight with Margarito. All right. And we just saw it. Well, I didn't I didn't see this. I'm actually just reading an article on it. Liam Smith had a recent fight. And I'm going to bring this article up real quick for my own reference. Liam Smith had a fight overseas. And during the hand wrapping process, he said, whoa. That's not legal. And the commission sided with him and his opponent had to rewrap his hands and ended up losing by a decision to Liam Smith in their fight. I think that was this year. OK, so like there are so many levels of. Uh, not not confirmation, I'm trying to think of the, the proper word for it. There, there's so many points at which you can regulate what is allowed and what isn't allowed. That's that's the best way I can kind of formulate it right now. My brain's kind of mush after work, but there there are, there are levels of of confirmation to say, okay, you did this right, this right, this right. Okay, the raps look good. You have the opposing team on looking as you're rapping. You have the commission looking there as you're rapping, and, you, and then the commission can sign off on the hand raps and say, good to go. All right, so. I don't know if this is gamesmanship by Fulton's camp. I think Fulton's a real one. I think he a dog. Um, I, obviously, he's a hometown guy from Philly, so I, I'm rooting for him. I also like anyway. I, I just love people that come out and just they just want to get people about it there, man. They don't play no games sharp. 
laser focused every fight and every every punch and every trap that he sets is, is with a purpose and he's operating like he's three steps ahead of, of his opponent playing chess while his opponent is playing checkers and on top of that he has the power to make you pay when you make a strategic blunder all right so i like both of these guys but it it, it it made this fight even more interesting than it already was. And I can tell you what, man, anyway, that camp, they, did, they do not take kindly to indiscretions or disrespect. We saw this, I, I, I can't remember the guy's name. I think he was a Puerto Rican fighter. And his trainer, I don't know if it, if it was his father or not, but his trainer, when the two camps came into contact with each other, I guess, you know, you know, uh, pre-fight festivities leading up to the fight during fight week. And the trainer shoved Inouye's father. Inouye's father has been his trainer since, I guess, childhood or whatnot. And there was no need for that. Inouye's team, they're always very respectful. You know, they just want to have a good fight and they, they want to throw down, but they want to do it respectfully. And I don't know if that was a way of, of their, the other guy's team – of trying to get into anyway's head or whatnot, but it backfired. Yeah, it got into his head, but not in the way that they anticipated. All it did was add fuel to the fire. And I think guys like that, and I think the monster is a fitting name for him. They when they get mad, they don't lose focus when they get mad. They don't they don't look around and, and see red and just just lose all concept of um what their game plan is supposed to be. No, they they focusing even more laser focus to the point where it's no games. Now I'm not just going to beat you. I want to hurt you and embarrass you in front of your family, friends, and your loved ones because you wanted to take it to that place. And I, I, I believe he's that type of guy from what I've seen. And I, cause I have a lot of that in myself as well. Uh, anytime that I, I fought or sparred or whatnot, I, I, I typically, that's why I, I never got into competitive fighting. And my my teachers would push me to go to tournaments, and those are fine and whatnot. But, like, cage fighting or being in the ring was never me because I always if, – if you don't come at me sideways, I'm not going to be able to amp myself up for that fight to be able to do what I need to do. I need to have a reason. Like, I need to be slighted or somebody crossed me sideways – then I have that switch, that monster comes out. And I, I focus in because I feel like um, I'm fighting for more than myself. That's the best way I can put it. Um, especially if you, you you come at family or you're, you're disrespectful beyond what is, is typically expected going into a fight. You know, you have some trash talk here and there. You might throw some shots, like the way that Spence and Crawford have. Like, you know, like, you know, Bud, we're going to roll him up like a like a dime bag. And then he talking about Spence, like, oh, we caught the big fish. We're going to fry him up and gut him. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's, it's disrespectful. But it's, it's like those are lighthearted jabs between two competitive guys versus crossing the line and talking about somebody's parents or their wife. Like like what we, we saw with Roberto Duran – and Sugar Ray Leonard in the first fight, when he's talking about Leonard's wife and saying, like, yo, I'll show you, I'll show her what a real man's like. Or, you know, same way Clubber Lang would do to Rocky. When you cross those type of lines, see, there are certain guys you cross that line with and they change. Oh, even better example, Conor McGregor and Khabib. Conor McGregor talking trash, talking about Khabib and his religion, um, t making it personal, right? talking about friends and possibly family. Um, and Khabib didn't take lightly to that. I know he mentioned his father in, in some type of way, like an off-color way. Not, I don't know if it was like extremely egregious, but it was disrespectful. And for Connor, he was just selling the fight. For Khabib, he took that as a matter of personal pride and honor. And he wanted to not just beat Connor, but destroy him. Right. There's certain there's certain guys 
that you don't take it to that level unless you are truly in your heart of hearts ready to go to that level. And I think in any way is one of those guys. So Bolton going to have to really be ready. Whether he intended to have that effect on any way or not, he 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 going to have to come in ready, okay? Even more ready than he already was. Or just, he had to, you had to come in there with the, the mindset that, um, this is all you know, all you got, and all you, all you, all you do. Like nothing else matters. Family, friends, nothing else. Because if you don't have that mindset, and you you coming at people's family and legacy like that, and, and trying to uh, undermine their honor and integrity, you you have to be a thousand percent ready to bring violence at a very very high, and um, I would say sickening level. To be, if I'm being quite honest, because that that person is going to come out to try to snatch your soul now. All right, so this is this is going to be this is going to be a great fight. I'm I'm very excited for it. Um, I've, enough rambling though. That being said, let's go ahead and go into the fights. Um, because I, I haven't paid a lot of attention to these guys in terms of like looking at their highlights and their fights and whatnot because they're not very well televised. And it, they're not talked about nearly to the extent that they should be. But I obviously know about Stephen Fulton. I, you know, and I, I've seen some of his highlights and I've checked him out more as of recent. And he's highly talented, very, very technically sound fighter defensively, especially. And he he like mixing it up. He like mixing it up. And that's why I think this fight is going to make for one with a lot of excitement and a lot of drama. Because anyway, you talk about wanting to close the distance and just take your head off, that's he the king of that, and he does it with speed and finesse. That's what makes him really unique, in my opinion. He's a power puncher who gets into the inside of the range and takes you out with speed and finesse. The footwork to be able to cut off angles and shut you down and get you to the corner where he can really set you up, set traps, and try to well off on you. He's one of the best in the business. And it's the reason why he's the number two ranked boxer pound for pound on the ESPN list. So, you know, let's go ahead and, and look at these guys right now. So in their box Rex, you have uh, Stephen Coolboy Fulton. He's the champion right now. Anyway, is going up and wait to fight him. OK, anyway, he's a little guy. So that's that's another layer to this fight that makes it really fascinating. So you look at Stephen Fulton. 29 years old, he stands five, six and a half inches tall, and he has a 70 and a half inch reach. And he fights orthodox, fighting out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. All right, and then going against Nyoya anyway, 30 years old, fights orthodox. He's five foot five, and he has a 70, 67 and a half inch reach. All right, so Stephen Fulton. Anyway, they're both undefeated. Fulton's 21 and 0 with eight knockouts. Anyway, it's 24 and 0 with 21 knockouts. That's very impressive, especially at the lightweights. Okay. Because you typically you don't get a lot of knockout artists at the lightweights. Guys that are like fighting at 108 and 112 and 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 115. You don't see a lot of knockout artists there. You have to be really special. You see a lot of guys getting stopped. You see a lot of TKOs. You see a lot of guys just getting absolutely embarrassed over 12 rounds. Like they just somebody that's really skilled is gonna wear your ass out over 12 rounds, but you don't see a lot of just guys getting knocked out cold. And that's what you're seeing with anyway. Especially, and it's it's gonna be interesting to see if the power translates as he goes up in weight, because this is a jump for him. It's going up to 122 to face Stephen Fulton, who has two of the belts. Uh, Fulton has the WBC and the WBO World Super Bantam weight belts. All right. So a lot on the line for both guys here. There's there's legacy for both for both of them. Even with Fulton being the champion, if you beat anyway, I mean, that puts you on the mat. That catapults you into, into the top 10 pound for pound. And now you get to call some of the shots as to who you get to fight next. Hell, you might even move up. I don't know. But extremely great opportunity for him. And the same thing for anyway. He gets a chance to move up to another weight division to try to be a champion, I think, in his fourth weight division now if he wins this fight coming up tonight. 
So that's that's the, the tail of the tape for those guys. And then let's look at their last six fights to see what they've been up to. So Stephen Fulton, he's uh since 2019, he's beat Paulus and Bunda, uh Isaac Abelar, Arnold Kagai, uh, uh Angelo Leo, Brandon Figueroa, that's the one that sticks out to me, and then Daniel Roman. Um, and he's had one knockout, and that was against Isak Avalar. But the one that sticks out to me is the one he had over Brandon Figueroa. F- Figueroa, uh, nice fighter, tough as nails. And that was his first loss was to Stephen Fulton. And he was 24. What, what was his, his record going to that fight? He was... Stephen Fulton was 19-0 going to that fight, and Figueroa was 20-0-1 going into that fight. I, I mean, <laughs> that was a big fight, big, big fight. And then uh, the one he had against uh, Angelo Leo, another very, very good win for Fulton, and that was for the WBO uh, Super Bantam, I believe. I believe. Either way, it was up for grabs, <laughs> okay? And he absolutely dominated in that fight against Leo. And he won 119 to 109 on two of the cards and then 118 to 110 on the other cards. So, I mean, he he dominated that fight. And then the one against Figueroa, that was a very close fight. He won it on an average of eight to four on two score cards. And then David Sutherland had it tied six to six. So that shows you how close of a fight that was. And you look at that fight, he had to dig deep. He had to dig deep. Usually he's he's laying back, being slipped at times. He'll lean on you, go to work on the body and and, and try to wear you down. But but typically he's doing what he wants to. This is one of the first fights where he had to actually dig deep because he got some opposition back at him from Figueroa. Figueroa was not a small guy at all, and that that was an impressive win. I like that win by him, and it's kept him sharp. And then uh, Daniel Roman, uh, a good stay busy fight, and he dominated that fight, one twenty to one hundred eight on two of the cards, and then one nineteen to one hundred nine dominant win. So he he's been playing. He's been staying sharp. He he's definitely. Somebody that's been on my radar. I keep hearing about him, hearing about him, hearing about him. Okay, he's there. Then you look at anyway. Anyway, 24 and 0. His last six fights. How many of them have been by knockout? Let's see. He's had five of his last six fights. He has won by knockout. He had one in 2019, right before the lockdown with pandemic with Nonito Donaire, who's a living legend. He's probably going to go in the Hall of Fame. Nonito Donaire, excellent fighter. I think Nonito Donaire had one or two big fights with Chacotito Gonzalez. I have to double check on that. But that was a, a great win there. Then he beat Jason Maloney by KO the next year on Halloween. I think I think that knockout against Jason Maloney, I think he slept him too. I, I think when I was looking at the, the highlights, they they mentioned that it was on Halloween before showing the brief clip of the guy getting stretched. Um, and then he had another fight the next year, 2021, Michael Dasmarinas, knockout. Uh, Aran Dipion, I'm probably butchering his name, TKO stoppage in December of 2021. And in June of 2022, the rematch against Nolito Donaire in Saitama, Japan. And Donaire asked about the hand wraps, I believe, and everything checked out because again it's legal in japan there's nothing illegal about what he's doing so it checked out the fight proceeded and then donaire got stopped in two rounds um i'm trying to figure out if there's something that happened during that the the pre-fight leading up the leading up to that fight that had him pissed off against donaire i think he said something i can't remember and then his last fight against paul butler in December of last year, knockout. So he's he's been on a tear, man. He's been moving up the weight classes and just absolutely dominating people. And it's going to be interesting to see if he carries the power up to 122 against, you know, look, Stephen Fulton, he's not a tank, but he's a strong dude, man. He's, he's a strong, solid dude. So, like, is the power going to translate against the guy who's a slick boxer? That's going to be the question. So with that being said, that's the breakdown of the last six fights. Let's go ahead and go down uh, category by category. And we're going to start out with speed. When it comes to speed, I'm going to give the nod to anyway on speed. Because I, 
Fulton's fast, but in a way, as a smaller guy coming up, even when he was at a lower weight, he has snappy speed, like quick, quick tick, twitch, dart in and out type of speed. Uh, similar to like a, a Lomachenko coming up or Manny Pacquiao. It just like quick tip twitch, just fast, just fast. Fulton, he's he's more of like a um the comparison I could think of would be if you if you look at football, a guy who's quick within 20 yards versus a guy who has a faster 40, but it takes some time to build up to that speed. Fulton's fast, but his quickness compared to anyway's quickness, I think anyway has him by a little bit. So I'm going to give the nod for speed and hand hand speed and foot speed to uh, Noyoya anyway. He's going to need that being the smaller guy coming up for sure. And I think that's one of the reasons why he came up to want to fight Fulton because he he thinks that he might have the speed advantage. And I agree. Second, we're going to go to power. And here again, I give the nod to Naoya anyway. Um, Stephen Fulton, respectable power. Not going to knock you out, no flash KOs, but he he's a precision type of guy. And it's more about the placement than the power. If he catches you uh good, he'll he'll buzz you and then stop you. And if you got a glass chin, he'll knock you out. But he's not bombing people out like Inoue is. And there's a couple of clips that I've seen of Inoue where he's fighting guys that are clearly bigger than him. Clearly bigger than him. And I want to go ahead and look at one of his previous fights. Uh, let's 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 go check out some of these guys. I can't remember remember which guy it was. Maybe it's Paul Butler. I don't know. Not not Paul Butler. Um, I just know I was looking at a clip of this guy, and the guy guy was tall. If anyway, he's five six, five six and a half, I think. Not no, that's that's folding. Anyway, is. Five, five, five. This guy had to be like five eight, which is not a giant in the grand scheme of things, but it's a giant when you're fighting in that weight class. When you're fighting down at one twenty two and below, and you're five eight, you you might as well be like Tommy Hearns, <laughs> especially if you got a reach. And man, he lit this dude up. Something serious, man. He thought he was going to come in there and impose a a height and weight size advantage on any way, and it just did not play out in his his advantage. And and to his advantage. Now, now, granted, Stephen Fulton is a much more skilled fighter than the one I, guy I'm referring to, but still, the power, the power is, is so great there that that's why you have these accusations of the guy possibly having loaded gloves. Okay? Now, whether these come out to be true, I don't know. These, these rumors have been persisting for years. All right? So it's it's going to be very, very intriguing for me to see how Fulton performs in this fight because you accuse him of having loaded hand wraps, your trainer does. Now, if you guys observe him getting his hands wrapped under the rules of the, uh, the athletic commission over there in Japan and everything looks good, when you go in there, you better tear him up. And you better not, you better not get hurt and you better not get knocked out. Because not only is that going to make you look bad, but if you get in there after seeing his hands get wrapped to your liking and you get hurt, in your mind, you got to be thinking, whoa, everything they said about the power is true. And I've seen his hands get wrapped and they're not loaded. I'm in trouble. So it's going to be very, the mental game is going to be fascinating for me going into this fight. And I will be staying up watching this fight. Uh, I might have to take a nap. I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm not gonna miss this fight. Um, so I'm gonna get the the nods anyway for power. Ring IQ. That's next. We could call it ring generalship, ring IQ, whatever you want to call it. Um, here is where I would say I would give it a. I, I would say it's a push between the two, because anyway, obviously he's been there and back he's just been running through the, these divisions but Fulton he's slick he's crafty he's here for a reason <laughs> the guy is almost as good as it gets 
at 122 and below outside of anyway. And both guys have tendencies that can be exploited. For Fulton, he gets a little bit too lackadaisical with his jab. He tends to, at times, lean forward when he throws a single jab or doubles or triples up on a jab and he's leaning forward against a guy that's has a very good jab and a very good hook in terms of countering with power. You don't want to be like that. We saw this with Cambosis versus Devin Haney. Cambosis got into a very bad habit of sitting forward and when he's throwing his jab. And Haney was just picking him apart. So Fulton's going to have to clean up that. Sorry, I had to pause and then uh, get my computer back on the charger. But he's going to have to be cognizant of that because you can't have – if you if you are heavy on the front foot, there's really no way for you to be able to retreat out of, uh, out of the danger zone, so to speak, when those counters come back. And he gets a little last day school with that, talking about Fulton. And he also – gets a little too um, happy going to the clinch and trying to, you know, get a few shots in there before he breaking off. That's not a place you want to be with anyway. That's exactly where anyway wants to be at. He's a solid infighter, Fulton, but he's not – anyway, he's a gifted infighter. You don't want to be there anyway. Fulton, you want to be at mid-range to long-range, keeping him at the end of that jab, hit him with a check hook when he tries to, when he tries to come in and close distance and and – Throw the jab and set it, set up the the hooks to the body. You gotta be sitting there with the check left, but you gotta be sitting here with that check hook to to greet him when he comes in, to make him have to think about what the what is coming back at me. You have to do that against a guy like Naoya. And then conversely, uh, anyway, he gets he can get predictable at times. Okay. He'll he'll come through in a high guard, and when when you throw something, he'll get that high guard up, reset, and before he throws back, he he got to get into that high guard first. So you, you know what I mean, if you can pick your spots and keep him resetting his feet, and keep that high guard up to the point where he can't throw his shots in bunches without being concerned about what's coming back. That's that's a, a, a point that of emphasis I would make if I was Fulton's team. Make sure that you keep him in that high guard and try to keep him walking on his back foot. Don't let this guy come forward and get comfortable because it's going to be a long or possibly short night for you. But you're not going to like it one way or another. So keep him on the back foot, but uh, keep him in that high guard and keep resetting him. Reset, reset him and turn him, reset him, turn him, so that you don't give him a chance to get a get a rhythm going. So I so ring generalship, ring IQ, I, I give a, a push. Um, that's going to be a coin toss for me. Then we go ahead and look at footwork. Footwork, uh, slight edge to anywhere, but Fulton has very, very, very good footwork. Um, there's not a whole lot to be said there. Anyway, just cuts off the ring so well. There's a reason why he's number two power pound on the ESPN list. I don't know about other lists, but it's, there's a reason why he's there because he cuts the ring off and he doesn't let you run. Once he he gets you where he wants you, he keeps you there and then he hurts you. Very simple. It's not rocket science. He's going to be on your ass. Bolton does a good job, however, of getting out of trouble. He'll get into a corner, try to set traps for you, and then if, he, if there's nothing that he likes, he'll circle out. He has the footwork to be able to do it. I think anyway's footwork is a little bit better, but anyway, I think we'll have issues at times trying to keep Fulton cornered. So footwork, I, I give a slight edge anyway, but it, it's it's not really about nothing there. And then last but not least, oh, before I go to last but not least, defense. Defense. Uh Fulton. That goes to Fulton. That's that's one of his strengths. He's a slick Philly boxer, man. And he 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 uses uses his length with, with his with his reach. He uses that. He's a slick Philly boxer. He'll he'll sit, shell up when need be, and he's really good with those one two, not literally like the one two, but one to two punch counters 
to to have give you something to think about. And that's where I think he can have some success against Inouye, but he's he going to make have to make sure that defense is whew, airtight, like going into space airtight. Like you can't let any oxygen get out, like like super duper airtight. Because if it's not, it's going to be problems. Okay, with this cat, because I haven't seen a lot of Inouye either. But just in my limited time looking at the highlights, and then, um full-length highlights of some of their most notable fights to get more of a sense of what they do round by round. Man, anyway, whew, that boy, you got to give him something to take home, <laughs> to think about. You cannot let him get off. Pause. Um, so defense, Stephen Fulton, he's going to have to make it a point of emphasis to really be airtight. And and when when anyway makes a mistake, you got to make him pay the toll. And then if you can make him pay the toll enough times, you might be able to get him out of there. So, you know, if the KO's there, go for it. If it's not, just make sure you're defensively sound, and that should make for a very, very fun and interesting night for both fighters. And then last but not least, X-Factor. You're fighting over in Japan on enemy turf, and then you just gave this guy a reason to really want to knock your block off with the accusations on top of the fact that he's already been just like a damn hitman, like Agent 47, man. Anytime you sign him, sign him up for a fight, he's like Agent 47, walks in there, no expression, very respectful, and then just tries to take your soul. You know, very professional. Goes in there, he's a killer with a suit and tie, just very professional, goes in there, hey, man, nothing personal, I'm just going to try to kill you this fight, and then when the fight's over, hey, you know, respect. That, you're, that's what you're dealing with, and then you want to give him extra fuel to the fire, not that that should necessarily make a difference, but the fact that the guy is already the uh, the Terminator in the flesh with Japanese heritage, nonetheless. Um, I have to give the X Factor to anyway. I don't know if he's going to be the next Manny Pacquiao. Who the hell knows? But the way he's coming up and weight through these divisions and keeping the power and the speed – I I just that alone makes him a problem, and then you're gonna give him an added reason to not like you, to really want to hurt you. Uh, I give the X factor to anyway there. So all in all, um, I'm going with with Noya anyway. I don't know if it it would be by stoppage. I I, I don't I don't know about that, but I think anyway is going to have uh, more tools in, in the toolbox than Stephen Fulton is going to have in order to come out with the victory in this fight. So I'm going with anyway in this fight. Let me know what your predictions are, who you think is going to win, why you think they're going to win, if you think I'm off base, if I'm making sense, if I'm sounding completely ludicrous, let me know. I love to hear. Not like I'm going, it's going to make a difference to me anyway, but I would love to hear your opinions and your thoughts and insights on that. Um, look, thanks for uh, tuning in and listening to me, those of you that have. And look, I hope you're able to stay up and and uh, see the fights. If not, catch the highlights. But I just, it's just one of those fights where you have a feeling you're you're about to witness something that you haven't seen before. These are two very special fighters, and I know that I I I chose anyway, and I, I lean towards them in a lot of categories. But I I truly do believe this is going to be a great fight because Stephen Fulton is a dog. He's a dog. Okay. Not D-O-G, he a dog. And he's going to bring it, man. All right, the same way Devin Haney was a dog when he went over to fight Cambosis in Australia. It didn't matter he was on the road. Devin Haney's a dog. Regardless of what you think about what happened in the Lomachenko fight, Devin Haney's a dog. And in the same fashion, Stephen Fulton's a dog. All right, and he's going over there. He's not going over there for just for a payday. He's going over there to win <laughs> and establish legacy. And really set his career off to the to the, the stars. That's what he's going for. Okay. And it's not just because he wants to do it, it's because he has the skills to do it. The question is, can he do it? Will he do it? Same thing for anyway. We already know what he's about. The question is going up to fight a bigger guy, guys that can throw back heavier than the guys you've been facing. Can you do it? Can you do the same things you was doing in college as you're going to do in the NFL? Can you do it? All right. Are you just another guy or are you Barry Sanders? Will you just step in 
the league the first day and you're just like, you're the best person in the field. Are you going to continue that trend? Remains to be seen. Either way, it's going to be a great fight. And then we get blessed a couple of days later with Earl Spets and Crawford. And I'm going to make a video on that as well. Man, this is just a hell of a week of fighting for, for boxing, man. Uh, let me know what you guys think. And um, I'm going to catch you all in the next one, man. Enjoy the fights. Peace.